welcome to today's session. I'm Ken Muragori, and I'll be taking you through critical reasoning. So what is critical reasoning? So critical reasoning is the process of studying, analyzing, and interpreting information to derive meaningful insights. This means that you're given some information and you're supposed to derive some insights from it. So in the GMAT, critical reasoning questions test the ability of the test taker to interpret the information provided as is, exactly as the author intended. So this is something that you'll hear me mention a couple of times today. So test your ability to take the information and interpret it exactly as the author intended. This means that no paraphrasing, no adding something or deducting something. So you must interpret the information exactly as it's presented. So because this critical reasoning is one of the sections of a verbal reasoning exam, and it consists of three parts. So we have stimulus, and then after the stimulus comes the question, and then as usual, in GMAT, you have the, your five answer choices. So the stimulus is a short passage presenting the scenario for the CR question. So it usually, but not always, contains a premise, an analysis, and a conclusion or argument. So basically, and most of the times, it will follow each other in this order. So you have a premise, you have the analysis and the conclusion. But you may find some actually starting with the conclusion and then the analysis and the premise. So it usually appears like, so this is the examination screen. So you have your short passage here, maybe three to five sentences. And then you have the question following it. Then you have your answer choices. So a premise, it gives some sort of background, and then the analysis gives a path to the conclusion. So you have your background information in the premise, so maybe the first sentence, and then you have the reasoning of the conclusion. So this analysis answers the question, why the author picked that conclusion. So understanding the stimulus is critical in correctly approaching a CR question. So why? Because if you extract the intended meaning of the premise, you reduce your risk of choosing out-of-scope answers. Out-of-scope answers is answers that say bring in or talk about information that is outside our passage. That means that whatever information that you have given, however you interpret it, it will have introduced new information that is not necessarily referenced in our stimulus. And then most questions are based on clearly identifying the conclusion or argument. So we'll find that the critical reasoning questions that don't have a distinct conclusion or argument are few. So that's why we are saying most questions are based on clearly identifying the conclusion or argument. So the moment you are handling a CR question, you must first try to understand the stimulus. So it's not a must that you really pick out what, where the premise is, but understand the stimulus as a whole before trying now to go and answer the question. So we have some markers that can show you that a statement is a conclusion or an argument. So we have therefore clearly thus, hence, and consequently. So if you see some of these, you'll probably know that whatever comes before it is our analysis. So the why or the reason for this conclusion. So these, of course, they are just examples. They are not the full set of markers. But whenever you see these markers, you know that that's a conclusion of an argument coming. So we have CR strategies. How should you approach critical reasoning questions? So these will apply to all critical reasoning questions. 
no matter the question type, because critical reasoning also has uh, different question types, but the strategy should be the same. So the first step is always verify your interpretation is from the other's exact words. So use the literal meaning of the passage. So this means that if you see uh, the author say something is almost impossible. Do not interpret this as saying that whatever thing is impossible. Because impossible means that there is zero chance or probability. And almost impossible means there's a slight chance that it's possible. So always verify that your interpretation is from the author's exact words. So the second one is understanding the premise. So make sure you understand the premise and then find the conclusion is present. Because if there is a conclusion and you miss it, and probably your question is referencing the conclusion, because some of the CR questions, they require you maybe to weaken an argument or to strengthen the argument. So make sure you find the argument of the conclusion if it's present. Then you track the reasoning behind the conclusion. So as we said, this was our analysis. So answer the question, where did the other conclude this way? So find your conclusion and then go back and find the why. So this why, of course, will be based on our premise, because premise will have given some background information. And then always take note of any modifiers or adjectives used. So do not assume that two similar words have one meaning. So we have some examples here. The use of effective and efficient. Do not uh, use effective if the other says efficient or vice versa. In the same way, if we have a good solution or the best solution or the only solution or the better solution, all carry different meanings. They don't mean the same. So make sure that if your passage says, say A is a good solution, do not assume that it says A is the better solution or A is the best solution. So make sure you look out for the exact wording of the other. And then be careful when pre-thinking to not scheme over seemingly unrelated or insignificant answer choices. So what this means is that you may be talking of say country A. So you say country A is peaceful. And then you're trying to find out why. Why is country A peaceful? And then you find an answer choice that begins with uh, country B. And then since you, we know that we're talking about country A, you automatically assume that because this answer choice is talking of country B, it's out of scope. Do not do that. So because this answer choice may be saying country B, which is a neighbor, to country A was the main cause, say, of conflicts in country A. Maybe they had border conflicts. So country B maybe became stable politically and the war ended, effectively making country A peaceful, say, again. So be careful not to skim over any answer choice that doesn't really look related just think about it if it's out of scope that's okay you can eliminate it but it may be your answer if it actually relates the way the author intended it to and then use process of elimination to get four wrong answers and one right answer this is true for all the sections that is a sentence correction and also reading comprehension and then make sure that the answer that you choose is supported by the information provided to you. Then be careful of answers with extreme language. They're not necessarily wrong, but are a red flag. So we'll see an example of this, but this means that if 
an answer choice insinuates that there's zero percent chance of something say country a never fights or country b uh, doesn't have any neighbors so just make sure that that's exactly what the author said and that way you will know if the extreme language makes it untrue or if it may be a possible answer so whenever you spot extreme language just go back to your facet and make sure that it's okay and then be extra cautious on the subject matter of the facet is familiar to you so do not export outside knowledge into CR. So what this means is that if, say, you are an economist and our question is about economics, you may find that some of the answer choices are actually true in the real world. But when we consider the information that we're given in our passage, it actually becomes out of scope. We are not supposed say, to consider whatever information that you get in your answer even if it's true in the real world but now if you export your outside knowledge into critical reason you'll probably get in trouble so be very cautious when the subject matter is familiar to you or if you're passionate about whatever subject matter you may be asked to find a solution to a certain problem and you may pick an answer that is not related to whatever information that is given so be careful when the subject matter of the passage is familiar to you so we have several types of critical reasoning question types and we're just mentioning and these are the main ones there are some that don't fall in any of these categories but these are the main cr question types so we have assumption questions in assumption questions is where we have your premise and then you have your conclusion but the the connecting part is maybe wrong or missing so the author made or whoever is being talked in the passage made the connection between the premise and the conclusion which was untrue so you are you are required to find that assumption then we have strong and the argument questions. So we have an argument, say, at the end. Then you're supposed to pick at the option that makes the argument stronger. Or really, it's more of like when you have a case and you present evidence that strengthens that case. So it's the same case. We can the argument is the opposite, where you cast doubts to the argument or prove that this argument may be untrue or is actually untrue. Then you have inference questions. So inference questions, you have information, and then you're supposed to pick an answer that can be inferred from that question. So an example is, say you say, John is 10 years old, and then Peter is 20 years old. So an inference here can be, John is younger, than Peter. So in as much as this looks obvious, it isn't actually explicitly stated in our statements here, but of course you can just infer that John is younger than Peter because he's 10, 10 years his junior. And now of course in inference questions you must be careful because some of the statements given in the answer choices are not inferences. Say like you can say John is Peter's younger brother. We don't know that these people, one of them can be uh, a resident of Alaska, the other one from South Africa. So you can't really tell if they're brothers, but you can definitely tell that John is younger than Peter. So that's an inference. And then you have resolved the paradox questions. Is they present two seemingly connected say situations so if we know that typically a if a increases b decreases and then you have 
a situation where A increases and B increases. So since this is the expected uh, situation or expected result, and this is actually the opposite, you are supposed to find an answer choice that explains this paradox. So that actually gives a reason or yeah, gives a reason why B increased instead of decreasing. And then we have evaluate the argument or hypothesis questions. So you are given an argument or an hypothesis, and then you are required to pick an answer choice that kind of gives a test or a way to verify this argument. And then we have identified the reasoning of role. So these are actually both phase questions. You have a passage with a section of it bolded. And then you're supposed to identify its role or what is it? Is it a main conclusion? Is it say a, a premise or what is it doing exactly in that stimulus? Then you have flow questions. Flow questions is where you have an argument, but this argument is flawed. So you're supposed now to, to pick an answer that clearly defines what flow that argument has. So that was a brief introduction of CR question types. And for today, we'll just do two very simple examples to get us started on critical reasoning. And then in the next sessions, we'll dive into specific question types and how you should approach them when solving them. You're watching Success with Bob Mwiti Show presented to you by AppStack America. AppStack America is a consulting company that helps immigrants find amazing higher education and job opportunities in the tech industry in the United States. You can find our programs by going to www.appstechamerica.com. AppStack America, we wake you up to the unlimited potential within you. So this is our first example. And as usual, you can go ahead and pause and try it on your own. And when you're done, you can unpause and we'll talk about the question. Okay, so our question says, when a polygraph test is judged inconclusive, there is no reflection on the examinee. Rather, such a judgment means that the test has failed to show whether the examinee was truth truthful or untruthful. Nevertheless, employers will sometimes refuse to hire a job applicant because of an inconclusive polygraph test result. So now we have our stimulus and then the question reads, which of the following conclusions can most properly be drawn from the information above? So you see now you are drawing a conclusion from the information. So this is an inference question. So first of all, you have some information here. It says if the test is inconclusive, there is no reflection on the examiner. Why? Because such a judgment, what judgment that the test is inconclusive means that the test has failed to show whether the examiner was was truthful or untruthful. So this means that if it's inconclusive, you can't really tell if the examiner was telling the truth or not. But despite these facts, employees will sometimes refuse to hire a job applicant because of an inconclusive polygraph test. So what can you infer from, from that information? So as usual, we'll be eliminating, so using process of elimination. So A, most examinees with inconclusive polygraph tests are in fact untruthful. So we want to determine if you can infer this from the information given above. So saying that if an examinee gets an inconclusive test, they are untruthful. But 
when you read the second sentence here, it says, such a judgment means that the test has failed to show whether the examiner was truthful or untruthful. So because you can't really tell if it was the truth or a lie, you can't infer A because the information given tells us that the examiner is not really untruthful. He can be or she can be untruthful, yes, but she can also be telling the truth, but the test has failed to determine whether it's the truth. So we can eliminate A. Then B, polygraph tests should not be used by employers in the consideration of job applicants. So B issue, B would be true if we know that all employers sometimes refuse to hire job applicants. So, or if it was that all the tests come out inconclusive, that means that these employers, whenever they use polygraphs, they would refuse to hire these job applicants. But we do not know that. And so we cannot really infer this from the information given. So we can eliminate B. Then C, an inconclusive polygraph test result is sometimes unfairly held against the examiner. So we know that the test, if the test is inconclusive, it shouldn't really affect the examinee, or you can't really judge an examinee by an inconclusive test. But in our last sentence, we see that employers will refuse to hire an applicant because their test result came out inconclusive. So for this case, the applicant is the examinee. And since they are a job applicant, it means they, of course, want to get hired. So if they are not hired, so this means that this inconclusive test has been used unfairly against them. So the, the inconclusive test is sometimes unfairly held against the examinee. So that's OK. We can keep C around. D, a polygraph test indicating that an examinee is untruthful can sometimes be mistaken. So we do not really know what or how a polygraph test when it's untruthful is interpreted. We only know, uh, and of course we don't know if, if uh, these applicants or uh, these examinees they are telling the truth or not, because the passage is only talking about inconclusive tests. We don't know anything about conclusive tests, that is truthful or untruthful. So we can't infer this because we have no information about the conclusive test. We only have information about inconclusive tests. So for that reason, we can eliminate the, then E, some employers have refused to consider the results of polygraph tests when evaluating job applicants. So we don't know this for sure. Why? Because even in our last sentence here, we see that employers will sometimes refuse to hire a job applicant because of an inconclusive polygraph test. Technically, that is considering results. Even if this result is inconclusive, it's still a result, and these employers are considering these results in their decision not to hire this applicant. And again, we don't know, we don't know if or how they behave when the results are conclusive. But just from this information, we can tell that they have considered the results. So saying that some employers have refused, that's actually the opposite of what our our premises or our stimulus says, so we can eliminate A, and therefore our answer is C. So we do another quick example. So go ahead and pause straight on yourself, and then you can unpause. So our question says pharmaceutical companies spend more than ever on research and development, yet the number of new drugs patented each year has dropped since 1963. 
the same time, profits at a constant $19.63 for the industry as a whole have been steadily increasing. So our question, which of the following is true, is the single factor most likely to explain, at least in part, the three trends mentioned above for money spent, drugs patented, and the profits made. So whenever you see such a question, and you see this part, the three trends, so you have to really know what trends these are so that you can be able to evaluate the, the question effectively. So what are the trends for money spent? So expenditure. You can see that pharmaceutical companies spend more than ever on research. So expenditure is increasing. And then that is money spent. And then drugs patented. So patents. Yet the number of new drugs patented each year has dropped. So this one has dropped. And then profits made. At the same time, profits for the industry as a whole have been steadily increasing. So profits increasing. So which of the following is true? Is the single factor most likely to explain at least in parts the three trends? So we are looking for an answer that will explain all the three trends. Okay, so we have uh, choices. So A, government regulations concerning testing requirements for novel drugs have become steadily more stringent. So which trend that, does this answer choice explain? So if the testing requirements are, are more stringent, it maybe can explain the second choice. So patents, why patents are reducing because these government regulations are, are becoming more stringent. So that means that probably the patents will go or will uh, reduce. So this option does not explain why the expenditure is up, does not explain why the profits are also up. If anything, the profits should have gone down. So A doesn't really cut it, so we can eliminate A. B, research competition among pharmaceutical companies are steadily intensifying as a result of a general narrowing of research targets to drugs which there is a large market. So if you look at option B and quickly read through it, you can miss a lot of things and you can easily eliminate B because it's kind of boring and doesn't look to have any information. But if you analyze B, research competition has to be intensified. So this means that whenever research competition or whenever competition increases or is very stiff, you'll probably find companies spending more. So expenditure, they spend more so that they can keep ahead of the competition. So as a result of a general narrowing of research targets. So this means that you are spending more to research on the same targets. So instead of these pharmaceutical companies researching of um, maybe large projects or very, very many projects that, uh, that result to drugs, which are used of a variety of maybe sicknesses, they narrow down their research to specific drugs that are, that say have large demand. So that means that if many pharmaceutical companies are researching in the same field, that probably means that the number of patents that will come as a result of this research will go down. So this potentially also explains why the patents are down. And then we can see the last part, these drugs, there is a large market. So if there's a large market, this means that probably profits can explain why the profits are increasing because of 
demand. So option B actually explains all the three trends, so we can keep B. C, many pharmaceutical companies have entered into collaborative projects with leading universities, while others have hired faculty members away from universities by offering very generous salaries. So this can explain the expenditure increase, but can't really explain why the patents have gone down or the profits have gone up. So eliminate C. D, the number of cases in which one company's researchers duplicated work done by another company's researchers has typically grown. So because it's duplicate work, you can't patent duplicate work. So patents go down, but we don't know anything about expenditure, or profits. So D is out. E, the advertising budget of the major pharmaceutical companies have grown at a higher rate than their profits have. So this means that we know advertising budget. So it brings in advertising budgets. And remember that we are talking about spending more on research and development. So this introduces another thing, which is another cost, which is advertising budgets. So it technically does not really explain why expenditure on research has increased. And then they have grown at a higher rate than their profits have. So the second part just says that the profits has increased, doesn't explain why they have increased. So it doesn't explain really anything. So we can safely eliminate here. And we have our answer as B. So as we have seen, the moment that you, it's, you really understand your stimulus and you understand the equation, it will be fairly simple to eliminate answer choices because you know exactly what you're looking for. And just because you know exactly what you're looking for doesn't mean that you rethink your answer and maybe come up with some sort of explanation such that you now skim through or jump over answer choices that don't look uh, like your pre-thought answer. So that's it from us. So to recap, always one, look out for the exact wording of the author. Number two, understand the Stimulus. So, sorry, so, so exact words to understand the stimulus and question first before going on to your answer choices. And then, number three, find the conclusion or argument if there. Number four, find the analysis or why so how did the author come to this conclusion and then number five review every answer and eliminate all the ones with the errors and make sure your answer is supported by the information in the passage so of course as usual process of elimination is your best friend so that's it for our lesson and We'll see you in our next session. Bye. You've been watching Success with Bomweti Show brought to you by Upstack America. Come back next time to hear more steps and missteps that I took on the path to becoming a successful immigrant in USA. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn.